The Nintendo 64 was filled with so many unique worlds ranging from gritty and dark to colorful and cartoony. So many developers were experimenting and attempting to push the limits of the hardware to unlock its full potential. None probably more so than Rare. Rare is responsible for so many of the most memorable games on the console, so it's only fitting that we explore one of their worlds right off the bat. What kind of ideas, theories, and interesting details can we uncover as we take a detailed look at the entire world of Banjo-Kazooie? Let's take a trip down Nostalgia Lane. This is Wandering Worlds. Into the world we go! Getting an up close and personal look at this place, there isn't a whole lot in the first area. We can see pictures on the walls, some just of the cast, but if you look to the left of Banjo's bed, you'll see a picture of Banjo in a forest, and this is a concept supposedly from Project Dream, which is the original game the team was designing before transitioning it into Banjo-Kazooie. I noticed that one of the other pictures that's not a cast member is the scene at the end where Banjo and company are vacationing on an island. I was initially hoping for some of these books to have some sort of easter egg on them, but they don't have anything in particular. One thing I also thought was a funny detail was Banjo has two of the same picture of 2D, one blown up next to his bed and one smaller on his dresser. Let's now move on to outside. This is the lively place where Banjo calls home, Spiral Mountain. The inhabitants of Spiral Mountain are certainly interesting. This place is loaded with sentient vegetables, presumably from the vegetable patch garden, but not really for food? Are these specifically grown just for training? Whose garden is it? Bottles? He's shown with a corn cob in his model here. Perhaps it is his, and he likes to eat them. Grunty's eyes are always something that intrigued me on her lair. I wonder what they're made out of. Emeralds? I noticed in Kazooie the eyes glow bright green, almost as if they are radiating energy, whereas in Banjo-Tooie the eyes aren't glowing at all, and one even falls out. I wonder if maybe the eyes reflect Grunty's magical power and status. You'll notice in the end of Tooie her eye falls out, reflecting what happens to her lair in the same game. Moving into the lair, you'll immediately notice the portrait of Grunty, but I think an easily missed detail is the carvings on the walls. Some almost appear to be pumpkins, similar to Banjo's transformation in Mad Monster Mansion, and another looks almost like a goblin, different than anything we'd seen in the game otherwise. Also, I'm not sure why there are eyes in the wall before the hallway to Mumbo's Mountain. These eyes pop out throughout the lair. Perhaps these are tools for Mumbo so he can see if someone was about to travel to his world? Could be why our transformation magic ends around this area. It represents the end of Mumbo's vision of what we're doing, and he doesn't like to lose control of his magic. This leads us to Mumbo's Mountain. Mumbo's Mountain is a very colorful world, and I think an excellent first level. There are only a few things of note here. One is the bull, aka Big Butt, that is unkillable. It's another remnant of Project Dream, the scrap game concept. Going further though, it seems like they may have also referenced him in Conquer Live and Reloaded with Bugger Lugs. Just a cool nod back to Banjo with his looks. Maybe they're brothers or something. Aside from the obvious Donkey Kong and Diddy reference with Konga and Chimpy, I noticed some things in Mumbo's skull. All of the details in his skull are super easy to miss. For example, he has all these items hanging from the ceiling. He has sacks filled with something, bottles, and even an entire cauldron. The weird stuff though is his whole skull appears to be made from skulls. A super subtle detail easy to miss. That makes this place actually really creepy. And if you look at the switch you use to activate transformations, you'll recognize the green emerald eyes. The same as Grunty's lair, just small. Now I'm wondering if Mumbo uses that to connect to the eyes in the lair hall. Maybe Grunty uses it to connect to her ding pots to show her things on the outside, which is how she can see Tootie in the beginning. That's all I have for this level, really. We have a small Stonehenge looking area, but nothing really too interesting. The tower isn't filled with much either. Moving back into the lair. I noticed here on the second floor the walls have another interesting texture. At first glance it appears like tentacles, but if you look close, you can see what appears to be Grunty's face and her hat. Then you can see a face above and a face to the left. I'm not sure who the left one could represent, the closest I saw was maybe Tip Top with his head shape. The top one though I think combines with the tentacle looking things, it almost looks like Weldar from Grunty Industries. Perhaps he was a concept back then, otherwise it's an interesting coincidence, the tentacle pattern really looks like his neck. On the third floor, we get yet again another wall pattern, this time showing what appear to be a turtle and a snake. Histup is the only snake I know of in Banjo, but it doesn't really look like him. Tiptup and Tanktup are the only turtles. When I entered the next room where the entrance to Treasure Trove Cove is, I noticed the same texture on the wall, but it was easier to see. This wasn't a turtle or a snake. These are enemies, the snippet crabs, and the clam enemies in Treasure Trove, aka Yum Yums. 
Treasure Trove Cove. This is objectively my favorite level in the game. The bright, happy tune and beach setting make me feel like adventuring. There isn't too much to note on the outside of the island that I could see. I thought it was funny this camera tool will actually show Blubber's jet ski on the ship for some reason. Inside Blubber's ship, we can see some cool details like the pebbles and starfish in the ground that could go easily missed. As well as the pile of Blubber's gold, I do wonder what's inside these crates down here though. I always thought inside Nipper's shell was hauntingly beautiful. You can see the same starfish and pebbles detail, but also the light shafts coming in and the specific colors used for this area really give it a vibe. This place is like the Blue's Clues house though, it's way bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. There's nothing of note inside the sand castle. Same with the stop and swap secret area, though I noticed the question mark isn't just a solid white color, it has some yellow speckles on it. In the entrance to Clinker's Gavern, we get yet another interesting texture on the walls. This time we have three noticeable figures, two serpent-like characters and one that looks more like a goblin. I wonder what they're basing these textures off of. Clanker's Cavern. A few interesting things I thought of as I'm exploring Clinker's Cavern, aside from the fact there's a noticeable flaming canister here that seems to be connected to piping that's just, well, open. In his little cavern, we have Gloop who somehow produces clean air bubbles in this murky, disgusting water. I noticed that holding Clinker down is this anvil looking structure rather than an anchor. It also functions as a lock. It's sort of a three-in-one looking device. I've also been curious about the mutated snippets. What is this area with a radioactive device in the middle and all the radiation that's leaking out? It's waste from something and the only thing I can think of that really matches it is the stuff in the ding pots. Which we learn at one point Grunty throws up in and washes her laundry in. Perhaps that's what this mutative substance is. Moving into Clanker himself, he's filled with machinery and organic material. It's weird how he's made of metal, but it seems he has sort of biological looking lining on the inside. Perhaps this is some form of algae or something. I did notice in the tunnels to get Jiggies, his stomach lining glows a bit. In his mouth, you can see more of the mechanical side with wiring and piping going toward his stomach. The fourth floor of Grunty's lair has a giant statue of Grunty herself, and she's pointing in two directions seemingly showing us where to progress. I never noticed the one arm is slightly angled up to point toward the door more accurately. A cool detail. Here at the entrance to Bubble Gloop Swamp, nothing super interesting except if you follow the path and go through the tunnel, where we unlock Freeze Easy Peak, you can see a texture on the wall showing Sir Slush. I love these details and it further backs that the other textures are in fact enemies. I noticed this symbol on Cheeto too, as he has a triangle inside of a circle, which could be a reference to a philosopher's stone in alchemy. Bubble Gloop Swamp has a few things that make me curious. One, who dropped this giant egg in the middle of it? To be honest, turtles and crocodiles lay eggs, but based on the size, I'm inclined to think it belongs to the crocodile, which is another thing I question. Where is its body? Is it underneath the swamp? The thing is giant. It's interesting though, we can go inside him via his nostrils and we still don't see a body, just solid ground. Maybe this thing isn't alive, but it's a house? Would that make the egg belong to Tank Tup? He's the only other option really. Also, is Tank Tup related to Tip Tup? Inside of Tank Tup, I tried to take a look at what Tip Tup was conducting to see if it had sheet music. There is something there, but it's too blurry to make out. It would be cool if it lined up with the notes they sing. Back into the lair, we have the entrance to Gobi's Valley. I'm curious about the hieroglyphics on the sarcophagus, but can't quite make out what it is exactly. Since the sarcophagus looks like Banjo, does he have ancestors from there? I always assumed he came from the Northern Cremosphere, but perhaps he has a rich history in Gobi's Valley. Moving right in front of the actual entrance on the wall, we have a texture depicting Gobi next to some trees. A nice touch. Gobi's Valley. Something interesting I've always wondered about the top of Trunker. What is it on top? He bears some sort of fruit or something. Is it a bandana? I'm really not sure. Upon revisiting this level, I'm sitting here wondering about how Kazooie is represented too, not just someone who looks like Banjo. We have both, Banjo and Kazooie. Perhaps since in Grunty's Revenge they do some time travel, they had a brief stop in pre gobies Valley and caused some trouble since these structures appear ancient. Let the puzzle room be a good example. In Sandy Butt's tomb, we can see more textures on the walls. When we get into the part by the sarcophagus, we can see in full color Banjo with a headpiece on. What's interesting is he does in fact have his yellow shorts. 
Some other funny notes, in the water room the rocks are laid out in a smiley face. When entering the room with Rupee, we don't notice anything other than he does have another green gem on his headpiece. This is too many green gems to be a coincidence. Nothing of note in Jinxie's room, and nothing of note in Stop and Swap. Coming up to the 6th floor, we can now see spiderweb textures on the wall and an evil pumpkin texture on Grunty's statue's hat. Following the path, we get the entrance to Freeze Easy Peak, which if you look right above the entrance, you can see a large Banjo-Kazooie image, which was a promotional poster for the game at the time. Ah, Freeze Easy Peak. Not too much to note other than the glorious soundtrack. I've always wondered who lives in the village here. Have you ever noticed the giant snowman had giant snowflakes on his texture? They look like large stars. We can also notice the variation of wrapping paper on this little pile over here. The one being important is Santa, confirming his existence or belief in his existence within Banjo-Kazooie. Inside Boggy's igloo, we see some pictures hanging on the wall. Curiously, one of them is Banjo and Kazooie. Why the heck does he have a picture of us before we even know him? Maybe we're relatives? Looking into the Christmas tree, I found some star ornaments that are seemingly sentient. They have eyes, just hanging in the tree watching you. Out of view, really. Wild. Anyone else wonder why the top of the stem inside the tree has a glass tree on it? It's a little delicate detail. The only thing in Waz's cave I found is if you look at the ice key, that whole section is actually encased in ice, and you can maneuver around it. It gives it a cool look. That's about it for Freeze Easy Peak. Now let's head on over to Mad Monster Mansion. Outside of this rundown haunted house, right at the entrance, we can notice a gate with Grunty's face on it. An easy detail to miss since you start the level facing away from it. The rest of the world outside is pretty straightforward. I didn't notice anything in particular that stood out to me. Inside the church, we can see a lot of small details with musical notes and a staff. One on the stained glass window, and then also on the organ itself. It's actually really detailed, and it probably would go overlooked on the N64. Evidently, the sheet music on the stand displays a short organ section of the actual music played in the church. That's just what I thought the tip tops maybe did. Maybe it actually does show it and the texture's just too blurry. In the cellar, all the barrels shown have 1881 on them, which is a reference to Rare's old game Attic Attack, back when they were ultimate play the game. Nothing of note in the shed other than there's a clear image of the picture you walk on, and nothing really in the well. Inside the dining room, we can see a bunch of pictures hanging on the wall. Everything's seemingly normal except for this nightmare picture of Mumbo. Mumbo used to be Grunty's teacher, so perhaps he used to be evil, but changed his ways? Or maybe that's how Gruntilda saw him until she realized he wasn't like that. There are a lot of other small rooms on this map, but none have anything significant aside from the BK Emblem stained glass room having a picture of Captain Black Eye, the villain from the cancelled Project Dream. Just worth noting, the bathroom with Logo is disgusting. But hey, at least it has a working shower. Nothing of note in the bedroom either, other than the big chest, which another YouTuber figured out is empty. That's about it for Mad Monster Mansion. But if we head back outside, we can find the coffin room, which is the only place we can find Mumbo outside his skull. Back in the lair, there are a few small connecting rooms. They have some similar enemy textures on the walls, but that's about it. But let's head into Rusty Bucket Bay. Some things of note from the outside are this area has a couple of Rare Rare logos floating around, some on boxes, and a flag at the back. On the back of the ship we see Twycross England, which is where Rare headquarters is, a fun little nod. I've also wondered what's beyond the gate in the yard so I crossed over and it's a large sea. That's all. This ship has tons of areas inside it, most notably the engine room that you can see the propeller control room in as well, though this and the anchor room really don't have much of note upon inspection. Not much can be said for the surrounding storage bins and things you get into, but within the ship, we have some interesting things. Like the cabin crew's quarters having a picture of Barry from Conquer. And because of our perspective in the game, we never really see the big metal door for the crew since we come in through the window. And if anyone knows what the actual images are used for these pictures, drop a comment. I want to know. In the kitchen, we can see a similar door, and in the pots, we see a good old beef stew cooking, and whoever was doing it sure made a mess. In the navigation room, we can see two large maps, the big one seemingly showing Treasure Trove Cove, 
and the other one I'm not so sure about. Perhaps something from another game by Rare? Maybe even Dream that was never released. Curiously, there's also a code written down 31211 right by it. Then finally, the captain's quarters has a nice picture of the rusty bucket. Now, we're entering Click Clock Wood. Four different seasons, let's hit them all. I like to note how much they differentiated the textures between each season. Even the skybox goes from foggy to clear blue to red. It's awesome even the textures on top of the walls reflect the season changes. When entering Nabnut's home in winter, we can just see the pink squirrel under the covers. Here's a good look at them. They look exactly like Nabnut, just with a color change. Inside his attic, when we find an acorn, I notice the acorns almost look like an inverted version of what was planned for 12 Tales Conquer 64. And then the whip crack room, which doesn't have much. Same with Naughty's house. Grunty's Furnace Fun. Now entering into Furnace Fun, Grunty sure has a liking for game shows. I love the subtle detail of the question marks on the walls. Now we've seen this room a million times, but what you don't see there is the audience. Probably one of my favorite finds in this entire video. If you look up, you can see images of enemies from the game watching the show. What's really cool is we see enemies we never saw in the game, like these dogs and the snakes. These are probably some of the textures we've seen throughout, so we just need to line them up. It's such a cool detail that most probably will never see since you're focused on the game show. Now moving on, at the top of the tower we see a clear colored picture of the pumpkin texture we saw previously. Going into the room with the machines, we can see two doors with green eyes. One has nothing behind it, but the other has a small hallway. This may have been a scrapped area. Now we navigate to the very tippy top. And all we got is grunty. Nothing underneath or on the side of the tower. Thanks for watching. I hope this gave you some interesting facts and made you curious to take a deeper look into games when you play them. Remember, everything put in these is intentional. Be sure to drop a like to help spread my content and subscribe if you haven't. Until next time, have a good one. Jiggy Look Back!